Welcome to the MAM journals. I think we're in an interesting time for bike development and launches. On one hand, you've got manufacturers launching 200 brake plus super bikes. And on the other hand, you've got a lot of activity in what is known as the middleweight sector. And what I want to do today is sort of talk about a specific part of the middleweight sector, because obviously in itself it's enormous. And the bikes I'm sort of thinking about are the bikes between 700 and 900 cc. They tend to be either twins or triples. And it includes bikes like Yamaha's R7, which is about 70 odd brake horsepower. The Honda Hornet, which is about 90. The Suzuki 8S, which was launched last year, which is 80-ish. And then you've got the Yamaha MT-09 and indeed the KTM 890, which are about 120 brake horsepower. All of these bikes are designed to be dynamic, engaging road bikes that are amusing to ride and have various degrees of versatility. BMW's bike in this space, in fact one of a number that they offer, is this F900R. And what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to go through the specifications, which won't be too long because it's a sophisticated but not a complicated bike. We'll go for a ride and then I'll come back and try and put this into some sort of space as to what it fits, how it rides and how I found the bike. OK, so I always think the best place to start on a bike is by looking at the engine. OK, so this is a... 895cc, it's a parallel twin, four stroke, four valves per cylinder. They actually use this engine in two of their mid weights. Um, they use, it's got, the XR has got ex the identical engine in it as well. The, it's fitted with twin overhead camshafts and it's middle in terms of the ranking of the power performances that we've talked about. It's 105 HP at 8,500 revs and it produces 92 newton meters of torque at six and a half again a couple of little comparisons the suzuki 8s a roadster i have tried and reviewed is 83 hp and 78 newton meters the honda hornet which i've ridden but not reviewed is 90 plus and less torque at 74. In terms of speed, if, you, if people are interested in that, this bike, BMW say that it does 216 kph, which is 134 miles an hour, and that compares quite nicely with other bikes in the category. Certainly the Suzuki does about 130, the Honda does 140, as indeed does the Yamaha MT-09 and the KTM 890. So you've got a, a feel for the spread of power. In, in terms of weight, it's... 211 kilograms, which is towards the upper end of bikes in this category. The Suzuki's 202, the Honda's quite light at 191. In terms of the chassis of the bike, this is uh, a bridge type steel shell. And coming along to this is a going to the swinging arm, this is dual sided, this is cast aluminium, and it's got this central strut in there. and that has got hydraulic preload on here and down on this side you've got some rebound adjustment. It's, they do do an upgrade on that where you can have the electronic systems but for this particular bike they chose not to fit it, which I was fine with. In terms of seat height, because I know that's quite important to some of us, um, this is 815 millimetres so it's not a big bike in terms of seat height and foot clearance. Suspension travel at the back is 142 millimetres and again I mentioned the XR and it will give you an idea that it's a different sort of bike. The XR has 172 millimetres of travel so it's a more upright adventure style bike rather than this styling the Roadster. Um, going to the front of the bike then these are Upside down 43 millimeter forks. There's no adjustment on them at all, so they are what they are, and they are as we, when we go riding. I'll I'll give you some some feedback on on that. Now, one of the numbers that 
I had to have a double take on, if I'm honest, was because I couldn't believe it, was this, the rake on this bike is 29 and a half degrees. Now, that is, that's cruiser sort of dimensions in conventional world. But in a, in a way that BMW often do, they sort of do it one way and then engineer their way out of it another way. And I'm keen not to get any more technical on this channel than we currently are. But they achieved that through something called offsetting, which you can go on the internet and go and have a look and find out what it means. What it, but, but it means basically the degree between the, the steering head here and the forks are different. So again, I'll give you some feedback on what that was like to ride when we're out and about. In terms of brakes, it's um, nicely fitted with these Brembles radials. And again, I'll give you feedback when we ride. And it's, it's on 17 inch rims and it's got 120, 70 tires on it. At the rear, it's um, again, 17 inch wheel and it's fitted with a 180 five five. Um, for the most of you who watched the channel before, you'll notice it's fitted with my favourites, the Dunlops. Uh, but again, more feedback uh, a bit later. Okay, the, the bike is also fitted um, as an optional extra with this gear shift assist, which is a quick shifter system. And although it's got a key there, which helps you get the seat off, it's actually what's known as keyless, which means that um, you just keep the key in your pot pocket, and press the button and it starts, and you open the fuel tank without any keys, which is, I think, quite a nice feature once I got used to it. Um, and I've had it on a few bikes now. The bike is also fitted with what's called a touring pack, which well, I'll show you a, a bit picture later with the, the image of the sat nav up there. But it means that it's got these um, pannier holders on there as well. And this particular bike finally has been fitted with a centre stand, which I like. It certainly makes cleaning the wheels ready for pho photographing a little bit easier that you can do it. You can do paddock stands on it, which I do for a lot of my bikes, but I think a centre stand is nice. Okay, so uh, let's, I like to go to the, to the front to go through some of the technology which is controlled at this end. It's got this very nice BMW style um, TFT. It's really clear and they're, they're well established and well proven. And it works with the whirly wheel over here yeah, and the menu when you're actually doing it. I'll go through a few of those in a moment. Um, you've also got on this side, you've got heated grips. It's got three switch levels on that. Three is actually quite hot on these. Sometimes the factory ones aren't. It's got the mode, which is about um, your power delivery. And this bike is also fitted, as you can see here, with cruise control. All of which I will, well, certainly the last two, cruise and modes, I, will, I can demonstrate as we're riding as well as to how you actually operate them. So going through the modes, this, this bike um, is the base bike in terms of electronics. It hasn't got the electronic suspension option and it hasn't, it's only got two modes in terms of power. So it's got road and rain. If you went for the upgrade, which some people like to do, you get, I think it's Dynamic and Dynamic Pro, but you get more, a different way that the power is mapped. It doesn't increase the power, but it does change how the technology comes in. One thing I, I like about these BMWs is you've got this, this ability to sort of drop through the menu and then go to this graphic, which is, I think, actually more useful than I originally thought it might be. Um, it shows you what your range is. And this bike has been fitted with the tyre pressure control system. So it, in other words, it measures, once the bike's running, it measures what the, the pressure is, which you can set for bar or PSI. And um, surprisingly useful. I, I didn't think I'd ever use it, but I do keep my eye on it. And, um, and if you have got a slow leak, um, if I'm fortunate to do so, then that will help you spot it earlier rather than waiting for the bike to go sideways. Okay, so this, I would describe this bike as a middle specification. Some of the bikes which North Oxford Garage are kind enough to lend me are loaded to the gunnels, um, which is quite often the case with BMWs. But um, this, this sort of middle course where it's, they've chosen some options but left others off, whether or not you as a rider would choose the same options, well, that's a very, you know, very personal choice. But I think it's very representative of what the bike can do. Um, 
you're about to see that I took the, the bike out in some pretty filthy weather and not surprisingly the bike got exceptionally dirty. I spent three hours cleaning it up for our filming today and it was actually an easy bike to clean and one of the things I like about cleaning bikes is that you don't, particularly if you, they're not yours and you're learning about them, is you do get a good feel for how they're put together. I think it's a nicely put together, nicely finished bike. But enough of the theory, let's go for a ride. I've been looking forward to riding one of these for a while. I like sporty mid-power roadsters and BMW in the UK have promoted this bike by creating a one make race series called the BMW F900R Cup which demonstrates the sporting capability of the bike. It is a support race for the BSB series and although one guy vanished off into the distance the competition for the other places was pretty fierce. We saw some great racing at speeds many fans could relate to. Recognising that the 900R has sporting inclinations and hoping to explore some of its handling and power capabilities, I arranged to borrow the bike when the weather forecast was dry. It proved to be a very British sort of dry, with torrential rain, standing water and low temperatures. The devil plays with the best laid plans. One of the roads I use to help me understand a bike is a road I actually call my bump test. Not many roadsters enjoy it, and the ones that cope with it the best are, not surprisingly, adventure-style bikes with significant suspension travel. The road is domed, potholed with broken surfaces and scattered with road debris. It was today also liberally adorned with standing water. A video best not included protect those of a sensitive disposition. Suffice it to say, I'm not sure which of us hated it the most. Me, the bike, or the stubbornly cold Dunlop tyres. I suspect it was the Dunlops. To be fair, bikes like these have been designed to handle and go well in the sort of conditions that most riders will ride it most of the time. With little suspension adjustment, it makes sense to have the factory settings set for warm, dry, mostly smooth roads. The conditions I was riding the bike in are not the natural hunting ground for the F900R. It can of course cope with it, but after a few small slides of protest I had to come to the conclusion that today was not the best to be too adventurous. The riding position gives a clear clue as to how the bike would like to be ridden. Your weight is over the front and your feet quite high possibly too high for those with longer legs unless you put a higher seater on it. It is, I would describe, as sporty. It's not a sports bike crouch, but more like an assertive roadster. The bike feels nose down and front heavy. I ride all year round and definitely ride differently in winter conditions than summer, adopting a more static body position and leaning the bike mostly by weighting the relevant foot peg. This is not how the F wants to be ridden. The steering geometry, riding position, gearing and flat seat was actually encouraging me to move my body across, open the throttle and push my way through the bends. Sadly, the weather conditions and Dunlop tyres was telling me, not tonight, Josephine. Other bikes that I've ridden in this category are similar. You do get more engagement riding them as opposed to just sitting on them. For me, it's actually one of the attractions of the class. Hoping that the weather would improve the next day, I decided to have a ride through Oxford to see how it rode in traffic. Oxford is a beautiful, historic and interesting city. It's well worth a visit if you're in the area. As in many times in its long history, Oxford is divided on its views. Some, keen on leading the way, are verging on evangelical in their zest to reduce traffic movement, congestion and emissions, whilst others consider the increasing restrictions in movement, access and speed limits an unnecessary hindrance to the mobility of those that live and work in the city. These debates get pretty heated. 
Recently, Oxford's application for further central government grants were actually declined on the basis that the proposal was considered anti-car, an outcome that delighted some and appalled others. This is the Woodstock Road, which leads to St Giles in the centre, through the leafy suburbs of North Oxford. A number of prominent academics have lived here over the years, and the university has a significant influence on both the culture and the architecture of the city. The centre of the city has buildings spanning centuries, of course, and the, actually the church on the left-hand side of the picture here was built in 1150. There are some particularly fine Georgian buildings in Oxford. The memorial at the end of St Giles commemorates the burning at the stake of three bishops, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley in 1555, and Thomas Cramer, who brought the Book of Common Prayer in 1556. The monument was built some 300 years later, in 1843, and it was actually funded by a number of wealthy individuals keen to reflect the university's Protestant tradition. Having diametrically opposed views is nothing new to Oxford. You may, by now, be wondering if you've accidentally stumbled into a history video, but the fact that I had time to reflect on such things tells me just how easy the bike is to ride in town. The firm suspension make it precise and the throttle, particularly in rain mode, but still good in road, easy and predictable at low speeds. It is certainly a bike versatile enough to be used for the occasional commute, should the mood take you. It's easy to filter as well. The next day the forecast was drizzle until 10am and then dry and windy, which proves the theory that there are lies, damn lies and weather forecasts. I took the opportunity to try the bike on some dual carriageways, changing the modes and trying the cruise control. This bike has two modes, rain and road, but not the two additional optional modes, Dynamic and Dynamic Pro. You would probably need better conditions than this to fully utilise the benefits of the upgrade anyway. Modes are easy to change on the go. Just press the mode button on the right hand cluster until the display changes whilst closing the throttle. Open it again and the selected mode is engaged. I actually use rain mode more than I normally do, not because the power was overwhelming the grip, but simply because the throttle was smoother and more progressive in the wet conditions. Cruise control is probably more useful whilst on long journeys or touring, which the bike could do. With a sporty riding position and small 13 litre tank, which gives a range of about 130 to 140 miles, my personal view is that if touring is a big part of your biking needs, other styles of bike might be more appropriate. In the BMW range, the XR version of this bike might suit regular tourers better. Probably more comfortable as well, although I actually liked the R riding position and found it fine for what I would want from a bike like this. The cruise control is equally easy to operate. The red clock symbol visible on the screen shows that the system is on and you engage it by pressing the buttons on the left hand side. A single press sets the speed, which will appear in green on the screen, and if you hold the set button, it will increase the speed in one mile an hour increments. It's deactivated in the normal way. You touch the brakes, the clutch, or close the throttle to suit you. It's straightforward and useful on roads with average speed cameras. The engine is, like many parallel twins, quite mechanically noisy but this one has a nice exhaust note as well. It's actually better than our audio suggests. I again got the sense that the engine, like the geometry, prefers a more, let's call it, vigorous approach to throttle opening. The bike does have torque, but the most fun is probably to be had at the higher end of the revs. The gear shift assist, quick changer to most of us, is like many of us tried, better up than down and more useful from third onwards. Below that, I just found it easier to use the clutch in the conventional way. I found the system useful and competent, but not exceptional. The brakes were good, firming up predictably and progressively. They're not sports bike sharp, but those that prefer that sort of brakes tend to gravitate towards 
full on full sports bikes anyway rain or shine well in this case mostly rain it was good to ride this F900R and my thanks again to North Oxford Garage for the loan Right, so how did I get on? Well, I think you can tell by the video, I didn't have the most auspicious of starts. Um, riding the bike in five degrees temperature on a very flooded potholes and bumpy roads with um, cold Dunlop tyres was, as us British say, interesting. Um, but I think I've seen the worst of the bike, but have yet to see the best. As you could tell by my rambling tour through Oxford, it's a doddle to ride in traffic and could certainly do those sort of those sort of journeys and indeed commute if that's what people want to do on it really easily. You could tour on the bike. But at the heart of this bike, this is a roadster. And at the beginning of this video, I talked about them being dynamic and engaging rides. And I got a very distinct sense that this is a bike that would be great fun. I'd really welcome the chance to go to the BMW Academy and ride one of these at Mallory Park, or indeed take one on a dry, warm English summer, which day, whichever day that turns out to be this year, and, and enjoy it. I think it'll be fun. It'll be, for me, what a roadster is all about. I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and if you did, you might be kind enough to press like or even consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. But as, a, as is always the case, what is most important is that you ride safe and you stay well.